Good evening, everyone. I'm Tishan Lynch, Assistant Professor of Orthopedic Surgery at Columbia University. And this evening, you're, uh, we are uh, excited to start our uh, our seventh webinar series. Uh, we're going to be doing the orthopedic uh, orthopedic injuries in dance, optimizing return to performance. We have a uh, we have a fantastic faculty tonight. Uh, um, joining me will be Dr. Turner Vossler, uh, who's going to be talking about staying on point, common ankle problems in dancers. We'll be talking about uh, the hips don't lie, hip injuries in the dance athlete. We'll have Dr. Julia Iafredi from uh, the Department of Rehabilitation and Regenerative Medicine. We'll be uh, talking about spine and neck injuries in dancers. And then we're very lucky tonight to have Dr. Shaw Bronner, who is, uh, who is um, the head of physical therapy with Alvin Alley, and she's going to be joining us all the way from Brazil tonight to talk about optimizing rehabilitation in the dance therapy. So that's who we are, and this is who you are. We have over 400 attendees online here tonight, which is uh, fantastic. We have 41 states represented, as well as three countries. So just uh, just as a reminder, some of our ground rules uh, talks are going to be about 10 to 12 minutes long. Um, you should uh, you will have a chat feature that you can please uh, ask questions throughout, um, and we'll try to engage you when we are not uh, uh, giving our talks. And then we'll have about 20 minutes of questions and discussion at the end. Um, afterwards, if you wouldn't mind filling out uh, the surveys that will be emailed to you, um, this is how we try to improve these webinars and, um, um, and come up with future topics as well, too. So without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get started, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Vossler, who's going to be talking about staying on point, common ankle problems in dance. All right. Thanks, T. Sean. Um, let me just get things pulled up here. All right. So as uh, Dr. Lynch was saying, we're going to be talking about common ankle problems in dancers. And so without further ado, we'll um, uh, just as a brief introduction, we'll talk about the epidemiology of injury and ankle injury in dance. And then we'll talk about three specific pathologies. So kind of posterior impingement, anterior impingement, and then we'll talk about some flexor halysis longus issues as well. So, uh, you know, as orthopedic surgeons, we deal with sports a lot. And so sports is a good analogy for dance because dancers are essentially performance athletes. Um, and on the way to becoming a professional, there's a very similar process of winnowing down that occurs um, such that the, the dancers at the highest level are commensurate in talent and athletic ability to the highest levels of any professional sport. So when we talk about, um, I guess the first thing to note is that injury in dance is common. And one, uh, one uh, professional company out of Brazil, over 75% of the dancers had an injury in a certain period of time, and there was over one injury per dancer. <laughs> if injury is common, re-injury is also common. Uh, in a separate uh, company in San Francisco, there were three injuries per dancer over a three-year period. And interestingly, about a quarter of the dancers sustained about half of the injuries which is to say that some of them may have had anatomic limitations, either um, lo uh, lack of motion or ligament dyslaxity that, that may predispose them to injury. Um, furthermore, foot and ankle injuries are especially common in dancers. In one uh, troop out of Sweden, 54% uh, of the uh, injuries that were sustained over a five-year period involved the foot and ankle, and in a separate group out of Houston, over a 10-year period, four of the six most common diagnoses involved the foot and ankle. Now, certainly, the injuries that occur will be relevant to what type of dance the person is doing, and in all types of dance, certainly foot and ankle injuries are not most common, but certainly in ballet and, and in other types of dance uh, like that, it, they certainly can be. <laughs> so the question then becomes, why are foot and ankle injuries so common, specifically in ballet? Well, the, the simple fact is that the foot and the ankle are tasked with doing things that they may not normally do. And obviously there's a lot of uh, pressure on certain areas. Um, if we look at an x-ray here, these are joints with very small cross-sectional areas that have a lot of uh, axial load applied to them. There's a lot of motion that needs to be present at baseline. In fact, if we look at these two x-rays closer, you can see on the, um, in the tibio Taylor joint here that this joint remains concentric even though the patient is on point where the space between the tibia and the talus remains consistent throughout. Whereas if you look at this ankle, it's clearly opening up anteriorly. So this patient has less motion than the previous one and may be relatively predisposed to injury because of that. But basically, the dancers have to make uh, jumps and require the power and stability to do that and also to land them effectively 
which just means a lot of uh, stress going through the foot and ankle and predisposing it to injury. So if we shift gears and talk about specific pathologies, posterior, posterior pain in the dancer is common, and it just has to do with the fact that they are in extreme plantar flexion commonly. You can have either soft tissue or bony impingement. If you look at the back of the ankle joint here, the tibiotalar joint and the posterior facet of the subtalar joint are confluent in the back, as are their joint capsules. And so there's a lot of soft tissue, really thick soft tissue that can be impinged back there. Um, the flexor hallucis longus runs right through that area. And the, uh, the ostrigonum and cyto process can also be impinged in the back. So an ostrigonum is simply a secondary ossification center of the talus. It ossif ossifies between the ages of eight and 13. And it can either uh, fuse to the rest of the talus, in which case it's called a cyto process, or it can fail to fuse, in which case, as in this one, you have a synchondrosis there, and it's called an ostrigonum. Ostrigonums are actually not that uncommon in the general population. About 10% of people have it, and certainly in most people it's asymptomatic. Um, but symptoms can be initiated by a single traumatic event. This anatomic study out of Turkey noted that the posterior fibers of the posterior talofibular ligament attached to the ostrigonum and may make it relatively stiffer such that the synchondrosis is more apt to be injured. The evaluation of these patients, basically the pathognomonic find is, uh, finding is uh, pain with passive plantar flexion. So they just get pain in the back when you plant, plantar flex them. On x-rays, you'll, you'll see whether an ostrigonum is present, and if so, how large it is, whereas an MRI will show either marrow edema within the ostrigonum itself, or in the tibia below, or the calcaneus, excuse me, tibia above, or the calcaneus below, or can show either thickening of that um, uh, joint capsule or the, um, or the um, uh, FHL. And so from a treatment standpoint, um, the, um, it's basically inflammation, and so we want to try to get this to settle down. Uh, can boot for a short period of time. Um, we can consider a single corticosteroid injection, although given its proximity to the FHL and, and the negative impact that can have, you have to be fairly judicious with the use of that. From an operative standpoint, the, the treatment is essentially excision of the ostrigonum or whatever the impinging structure is uh, with debridement of the soft tissues as necessary. So. Certainly historically, this has been done through an open poster medial approach, and this is a review of a, a fairly large study of 38 patients. 40% um, of these patients had concomitant FHL pathology, and, and a high percentage, the 94% of them were able to return to their pre-symptom level of dance at about two months. Uh, the trend, however, is to try to do these through perhaps a more minimally invasive approach, a, a posterior ankle endoscopy, and this will be a theme for, for a couple of these uh, problems. The potential advantages here are, number one, that when you do a postremedial approach, you typically have to move the neurovascular bundle out of the way, which is certainly very doable, but by an endoscopic approach, you really don't have to involve the neurovascular bundle, so it's potentially safer. Uh, the other advantage is that you, you really actually get a better look at the posterior ankle from an endoscopy and, and could potentially see some capsular impingement or something of that nature that you wouldn't necessarily see from a postremedial approach. Um, the problem, as we'll see, is that the limited data uh, really limits what we know about this. There's really just case series and case reports. And so, but the early results are encouraging. So there's certainly more work to be done there. One of the other difficulties in general is that the outcome reporting just tends to be variable. If you notice from that previous study, it was basically just whether the person was able to return to dance. And so that uh, makes uh, comparison a little bit difficult. And we'll come back to that. So we switch gears and talk about the FHL. So in many ways, this is kind of a sister pathology. It's certainly different, but it's also exacerbated by extreme plantar flexion. And here you can see on this MRI, the FHL is essentially, it's really a posterior structure at the level of the ankle, just anterior to the Achilles tendon. And this, this one has certainly shows some pathology with some tearing in the tendon and some uh, um, uh, fluid around it. Stenosing tenosynovitis, however, is a problem specifically related to really dancers and ballet dancers. It's pretty rare in the general population. When the ankle's in plantar flexion, the FHL, the posterior tib, and the perineus longus help to stiffen the foot and provide some stability there. And certainly when, uh, when a person is weight-bearing on their metatarsal heads, then the, the toe flexors really do provide a large measure of stability, um, and specifically the FHL because it's just a bigger, stronger muscle than the FDL. Uh, some people have posited that perhaps uh, there's an area of relative avascularity in the posterior ankle and the FHL, but it's hard to know how clinically relevant that is. Um, in terms of evaluation, this picture really shows it. So basically, it's posteromedial pressure um, with motion of the hallux can recreate the pain. Sometimes people can actually have a trigger toe, like a trigger finger where it gets caught up, although that's less common. 
non-operative treatment, the main thing to note here, because there's a lot of similar themes with the non-operative treatment, um, but basically you want to limit point work and jumps, which puts a lot of stress on the FHL, which from an operative standpoint, is basically release of the fiber, fiber osseous sheath that contains the FDL, which is demonstrated nice here with this rather injected looking FHL. And then you've got the uh, sheath that's been released here on, on both sides. So the results of FHL release are generally pretty good, although as you'll notice, both uh, this paper and the subsequent one are, are over 20 years old. So this is a paper by Jim Samarco uh, with basically the outcome measure used, which is whether they had a, a poor, a good, or an excellent result. And as you can see, most of them did well. Um, this is a, a paper out of Boston Children's where they, um, you know, once again, a high percentage of the patients were able to return to their pre-injury level of dance, um, you know, reasonably quickly. Um, once again, there's a trend towards doing this endoscopically, um, although we have limited data here. So this first, first paper is, is really a technique paper by Funasaki out of Japan, um, where they basically just lay out their uh, operative technique and then their post-operative protocol, which is to get people back to class in about four weeks, which is certainly much quicker than uh, you know, historically uh, what has been done. Corte Real, this is a paper out of Lisbon, um, and this was a bit of a mixed bag. These were not all, or most of them were not dancers, but they had FHL pathology, and it's basically just uh, laying out the, the technique, noting that most of their patients had, did have good results. So once again, you really need more data, um, but the initial results on this are promising, and it may be um, maybe the, the wave of the future. So anterior ankle impingement, kind of uh, honing in on our last topic here, uh, anterior ankle impingement is, is the most common clinical problem in the general population, certainly of these three. Um, it's the same concept. There's you know, tissue that gets impinged in the anterior ankle that can once again be soft tissue or bone. And although it's relatively straightforward, the exact pathogenesis is not entirely understood, although it's likely related to extreme uh, ankle motion, most notably in this case, dorsiflexion, but maybe plantar flexion as well, uh, coupled with uh, repetitive ankle trauma. Um, as we know, dancers undergo extreme ankle plantar flexion and, and um, may put, uh, certainly put strain on the anterior capsular structures, and extreme dorsiflexion just brings them into close proximity so that they can impinge upon one another. Um, for the soft tissue structures, the ATFL, or the, the anterior talofibular ligament, is a capsular thickening, essentially, and so it forms the anterior lateral capsule, or forms part of it. And so when it's injured, typically there's scar tissue formation, and you may get some thickening there, which can subsequently become... Uh, you know, cause some impingement in the, uh, in the ankle joint. There's also what's called Bassett's ligament, which is an inferior band of the anterior inferior tibial fibular ligament, or the anterior syndesmosis, which can also uh, become impinged in the ankle. But essentially, most of these, you get a cycle where you get some injury, and then because of that, the, the soft tissues swell, and then they impinge further with, uh, with dorsiflexion in this repetitive kind of extreme motion. So, whereas in the posterior impingement, they have pain with plantar flexion, in this case they have plan with uh, dorsiflexion, because it can be coupled with uh, uh, you know, ankle ligamentous injury, there can be some ankle instability. Um, sometimes patients can have anterolateral ankle fullness, although that's certainly uh, common sometimes in people that don't have injury. Um, the other, so the soft tissue component I talked about, there's definitely a bony component as well, uh, which oftentimes can be easy, easily seen on a, on a lateral x-ray off the tibia, on the talus, it can be harder to evaluate because there can certainly be medial osteophytes on the tailor neck, which require either a specific x-ray or three-dimensional imaging to really see well. Um, from a non-operative standpoint, the, the main thing that I would point out here is that you just want to avoid that kind of maximal dorsiflexion um, because that's really what's really going to cause the problem and cause the impingement. From an operative standpoint, certainly arthroscopic debridement of the impinging soft tissue and bone is the treatment of choice. And there are certainly a host of studies that have looked at that, although this is the only one that's really looked at it specifically in high-level dancers. Um, and they noted that uh, all of the patients, unsurprisingly, had prior ankle trauma. Um, about half of them had significant bone spurs that had to be removed, and essentially all the impinging tissue removed. And, and the results are, are pretty similar to the other two pathologists we listed, where you know about 80 to 90 percent of the patients were able to return, um, you know, within about two months. Two of those patients actually had to have a repeat debridement down the road a bit, and did well subsequent to that. So. In conclusion, you know, I had the good fortune to train with Bill Hamilton, and certainly he is a, is a titan, uh, both in the foot and ankle world and in the dance world, and he um, would always say that, you know, dancers are, are the best patients to take care of, and I would certainly echo that, They're really people that love what they do and want to get better. Um, the trend, as I said, is towards less invasive surgery, although it remains to be seen, 
um, you know, exactly where the uh, advantage is going to be there. Um, and then as far as future directions, um, you know, one of the difficulties with these patients is comparing apples to apples. And so, you know, it's certainly difficult because it's a very select population. And these problems even then are, are not super common, but um, the development of more disease specific outcome scores could certainly help with comparison. And then, uh, you know, there's a big push in the sports world for objective return to play criteria and certainly objective return to performance criteria which should be a, a, is a worthy goal going forward. So thank you. That will uh, include my portion here. So let me just uh, transition things back to Dr. Lynch for to tell us about those hips. All right, great. Uh, thanks so much, Turner. So now we are going to, as he said, transition. Um, uh, we're going to transition to hip injuries in the dance athlete. So here are my uh, disclosures, none of which are relevant to, uh, to the content of this talk. On one, uh, to the content of this talk. So the, the one thing um, that I've come to learn as I've taken care of a lot of dancers over the last several years is that dance athlete is tough. Um, by the time that they get to see me, um, it's been several months since they've been working with their physical therapist or their trainer with their dance company. And by the time that they actually talk to their dance, uh, to their, their, their respective trainer or rehabilitation specialist at their company, they've been dealing with this for several months. And what they're able to do in order to perform, um, I would rival them to some of the toughest football and ice hockey players that I take care of. And additionally, these athletes are unique as well, too. They start to, they start to uh, perform at an early age, and as they progress to higher levels, they typically train for multiple hours uh, per day, particularly during their adolescent years. Um, they're unique in their ability to dance and obtain extreme ranges of motion that uh, someone such as myself would ever dream to attain. And with that, they need to be able to have, uh, they must be able to sustain strength, flexibility uh, within that range of motion as much of it is demanded of their hips, which allow for them to do most of the choreography uh, that's required. And dancing emphasizes leaping and landing, which involves significant hip strength, control, and compensation. Uh, dance involves extreme hip abduction, flexion, extension, as well as external rotation to allow them to turn out. Uh, however, these extreme ranges of motion can also put them at risk for labral injuries and subluxation events. And in terms of the necessities, and, you know, a dancer needs to be hypermobile, whether it's based off of genetics or acquired. And they also can uh, acquire, uh, they can also acquire soft tissue laxity, which develops over time um, and with extensive training. Um, in dance, uh, turning out is emphasized. And with this, the hip is in external rotation, uh, with the remainder of it coming from external rotation at the knees, uh, with 10% uh, of it coming from the knees, 12% of it coming from uh, tibial torsion. And the increased uh, hip external rotation in the dancer seems to result from femoral retroversion and less anniversion or soft tissue laxity or a combination of both. So as you can see uh, here, when we talk about anniversion or retroversion, we're talking about the direction that the uh, femoral neck is pointed at. Um, on the left-hand side there, um, about 15 degrees is considered normal. Uh, in ind individuals who have significant amount of anniversion, um, as you see in the middle there, um, probably doesn't necessarily work for them to be able to uh, uh, turn out, uh, but having more of a neutral uh, version or what we call retroversion is allowing them to do this turning out. And then finally, in terms of the hormonal influence, uh, particularly we see this in female dancers, prevalence of hyperlaxity that increases in females after puberty. Uh, this is expected since there's high hormone levels uh, during ovulation of the menstrual cycle and during pregnancy facilitates the loosening of the pelvic uh, ligaments. Uh, dancers with joint hypermobility syndrome or generalized joint hypermobility have a Bain score of over four. And in, a, uh, in certain studies, they've seen that um, individuals uh, who are professional dancers, about 20 to 66%, depending upon the company, have hypermobility. Um, so whether this is an innate or acquired hyperlaxity allows for these athletes to achieve the professional status. Um, however, as we mentioned earlier, it can put them at risk for injury and uh, uh, prolong their return to play or return to dance. And this is... Um, a, uh, from a recent study looking at female dancers breaking it up from under 12 to over 12. And the, uh, we are really concerned about dancing injuries because hip pain, particularly hip pain and injuries, can lead to uh, loss of work or lost performance time in these uh, athletes uh, with the demands that they're placed on the hips. Um, these hips can get injured. Um, the numbers have varied anywhere from 7 to 50 percent, depending upon the study that you're looking at. And it can do, uh, contribute to hip pain and injury in dancers, including osteoarthritis, hip plasia, hypermobile hip, 
uh, labral tears or femoral acetabular impingement. Also, you can develop these compensatory soft tissue issues that you can see in the dancing athlete uh, that can involve iliopsoas uh, bursitis, ischial femoral impingement, or uh, ischial apophysitis, which are a little bit beyond the scope of tonight's talk value. I've mentioned it nonetheless. Um, but at the end of the day, it's essential to evaluate the dancer uh, accurately by, di by, di by diagnostic means as well as examination to help to establish a proper treatment plan uh, with, a, uh, with a multidisciplinary approach as this will allow for uh, the athlete to be able to return to dance with little to no co consequence as a result of their injury. And just in terms of kind of our, our overview, um, I think in terms of many of the uh, injuries that we're going to talk about tonight, or that we see with dancers and the ones that we'll talk about tonight are really involving uh, hip impingement, uh, hip dysplasia, or, or instability, or some type of combination of the two. And in terms of femoral acetabular impingement, that's essentially just a big fancy word for extra bone that's present on either side of the hip bone, whether it's coming off of the anterior aspect of the femoral head or coming off of the acetabulum. And we describe two different types of lesions. There's uh, the cam type impingement, in which there will in which there will be that extra bump of bone that comes off the anterior femoral neck. We tend to see this more in young active males. We'll see them in our football, soccer players, but I've seen them in, in male dancers as well. Uh, pincer lesion. We tend to see the, uh, this is more the result of overcoverage of the uh, of the femoral head by the acetabulum, and this is what we tend to see more in uh, uh, more in dancers um, as well as uh, individuals who are doing a lot of hypermobile um, exercises. So we tend to see this in kind of um, the middle age uh, crowd where they're doing a lot of yoga or Pilates. And the reason why we care about uh, femoral acetabular impingement is because it can lead to labral tears and potentially predispose someone to arthritis. And as you can see on these videos here, when the hip is going up into flexion, the labrum doesn't tear in half like an ACL or a rotator cuff. But what it does is when that bump of bone bumps into the labrum, it displaces it and can cause shearing of the articular cartilage. Now, talking about that pincer lesion, when the hip goes up, the labrum doesn't necessarily tear, but it gets pinched between the two pieces of bone. So it gets pinched between head neck junction and gets pinched between that that over coverage of the acetabulum and sometimes on MRI those can be a little deceiving because uh, we won't necessarily see that common uh, tear that we will uh, see with someone who has a uh, camp lesion and the way that I think about it is kind of the smoke and the fire so the smoke is that is the pain that you're having from that label tear as you can see in this video here we're pushing on the labrum and it's um, it's uh, causing some separation of the chondrolabral junction. Meanwhile, what is uh, the fire is really this extra bump of bone. So you can see the pincer lesion that's uh, on the left-hand side of your screen and the cam lesion, which is on the right-hand side of the screen. So this is a bony problem that is causing a soft, uh, that's causing soft tissue pain. Now, in terms of uh, hip dysplasia or hip instability, this is, this, uh, there's, um, there's many different forms of it, but essentially uh, we tend to see this uh, more commonly in females where there's inadequate development of the acetabulum. Um, can sometimes have some uh, dysplasia, can also come in the form of some uh, proximal femoral issues as well, uh, too. But essentially, what we are dealing with is a reduction in the contact of the two surfaces, in which allows for the athlete to have increased range of motion, which can cause an imbalance and put more stress onto the hip joint that can predispose them uh, to labral injuries or hip arthritis. And we tend to see this more commonly in females. Um, um, more commonly in females. And as dancers advance, there might be a selection bias for those with increased range of motion, uh, which is a result of the soft tissue laxity or the underlying dysplasia. And in general, uh, acetabular coverage or version are predictive of hip internal rotation with increased acetabular coverage or acetabular retroversion associated with uh, less uh, internal rotation. And in in, in these particular uh, athletes, uh, they'll tend to have different types, they'll have some characteristic in particular pathology. Their labrum are gonna be much bigger. They're gonna be more hypertrophied as a result of needing to make up for that lack of bone that's present off of the acetabulum. And additionally, because of their hypermotion, that's gonna be putting more stress on the ligamentum teres as well too. So in terms of the history, these, uh, these athletes will come in with pain about the anterior aspect of their hip. They'll have pain uh, with uh, cutting motions, jumping, uh, but they'll also have pain with it, um, activities of daily living, uh, such as putting on socks or shoes, going up and down stairs. They'll also describe pain in a C-shaped distribution in which they'll put their, pain, uh, their hand around their hip and say that their pain feels like it's deep between their two fingers. In terms of the physical exam, they'll have some limitations of motion, particularly hip flexion and internal rotation. They'll have some limitation of, um, they'll have a positive impingement sign in which uh, when we bring the leg across the body, it will reproduce that pain. So it will cause the femoral head and the, and the acetabulum to butt up against each other and pinch that labrum and reproduce that pain. So on this video here, you can see this as the hip goes up into flexion, we're internally rotating, and then we're bringing it across the body. That's a classic sign for an individual who has pain coming from a labral tear.
Um, additionally, uh, you can do a Fabier test uh, where you have them cross their leg. You can do a manual muscle test to test their, uh, their adductor strength. But if they're having pain coming from their SI joint, um, that can also be some compensatory soft tissue issues that you're dealing with. Um, in dancers, they will also they can also have pain coming from hip flexor tendonitis or iliopsoas uh, bursitis, and by doing a resisted straight leg raise, that can typically um, uh, reproduce that pain for these athletes. So, um, in terms of these uh, individuals, um, looking out uh, for lateral or posterior based symptoms can sometimes uh, point to abductor fatigue. If they have pain in terminal flexion, it uh, makes you think that they're having pain coming from their labrum or what we call subspine impingement because they have a prominent anterior inferior iliac spine. And in terms of these athletes, the demands that they put on their hips uh, are greater than their functional range of motion, so they can develop these uh, compensatory injury issues. So uh, in terms of the evaluation, we'll always start with plain radiographs. And, and quite honestly, plain radiographs tell me far more about what's going on in terms of these patients uh, than what an MRI or what a CT scan might show. And we'll typically get those for uh, preoperative planning purposes. You can see on this uh, x-ray on the right, this was a dancer that we had who had a prominent uh, cam lesion. And you see that uh, there's uh, no sphericity on the superior aspect of that femoral neck. In terms of our treatment for this, we're typically going to try to rest um, try some anti-inflammatories, work on physical therapy, and we, um, we're quite, uh, we, we do uh, like to use injections for both therapeutic as well as for diagnostic purposes um, to help us rule in or rule out potential sources of pain. Uh, physical therapy, working on uh, core training as well as stabilization, working on any muscle balance that might be present, working on joint mobility and trying to modify some activities that they might be doing. And I'll, I would obviously defer to Dr. Bronner to go into some of the details of that in her talk, but just wanted to give you some broad strokes here. Um, one thing to take into consideration with this uh, athletic population is the role of pelvic tilt. Um, having uh, just 10 degrees of anterior pelvic tilt can have uh, can decrease their internal rotation by six degrees, but meanwhile, by trying to correct that and bring it more of it into a posterior tilt, you can actually improve the range of motion and potentially uh, get rid of that abutment that might be present. Um, additionally, being on the lookout for uh, uh, lower cross syndrome in which there's weak abdominals with the weak gluteus maximus, but tight hip flexors and tight thoracolumbar artery cancers can also put these athletes at risk as well too. And I just want to finish up here with a case. I, I know this is one thing that I get asked all the time is trying to get a sense of what actually goes on uh, in athletes who uh, fail non-operative care. So this is a dancer who is at one of the dance academies uh, here in New York City uh, who was having pain for about one year. Um, she, on talking to her further, she probably had had this for a little bit longer, but was trying to deny the fact that she actually had pain and she was at one of the top uh, dance schools and did not want to lose her position. It wasn't until uh, dealing with it for an extended period of time that she finally uh, went to go see the athletic trainer um, with her dance company. Uh, the pain was present about the anterior aspect and was sharp, but she was not having any improvement of her symptoms with activity modification and she did have an interarticular injection that gave her significant pain relief. Um, as you can see here uh, on these plain radiographs, the one on your right, you can see uh, what is uh, what is the cam lesion in this particular athlete. There is no signs of dysplasia uh, that were present, and that's something that is important because a lot of times in these dance athletes, uh, dysplasia is something that is quite frequent and um, is something that is not uh, amenable to fixation with arthroscopic uh, treatment alone. Here's our MRI um, where you can see that uh, there's fluid within the substance of the labrum. And when we do these hip arthroscopies, what exactly we have to do is we have to put patients in this torture device here. We put their feet into these boots, we have to pull onto the hip, and, and then that allows for us to create some space. So when we get into the hip joint, we're able to look at this, uh, the femoral head on your left and the acetabulum on your right. What I'm pushing on is that is the labrum. And underneath that labrum, you can see that there's some bouncing of that cartilage of the acetabulum, and that's what we call the wave sign. So the, as I said, the labrum doesn't necessarily tear in half, but what can, what can happen is it can cause uh, separation of the cartilage behind, um, or I'm sorry, off of the bone, but something we might not necessarily look at. Um, assessing the pincer lesion. So we're looking right here. This is that big block of bone that's coming off of uh, the acetabulum. The labrum's on the lower portion. So you can imagine when you're going into flexion or deep flexion, lunging, or any type of dancing uh, activity, that that bump of bone is banging into the labrum and can cause that pain. So what we end up having to do is we come in with a, a fancy burn. We're able to reshape and recontour that acetabular rim and, and bring that bone down so that we can create a little bit of clearance for the uh, uh, for the labrum. Now you can see after we've created that space there, we've brought that down, uh, so that should no longer be an issue. And then finally, what we're able to do is we're able to pass suture. So what we, what we do is we're able to drill a 1.8 millimeter uh, hole into the bone and we have uh, we bury suture into there and then we're able to pass it around the labrum 
And then we're, after that, we're able to do some fancy knot tying to reestablish, uh, to bring the labrum back onto the socket and to reestablish the labral seal. And that alone uh, can help uh, athletes, uh, these dance athletes uh, with their pain. The labrum does have nerve fibers. So when they're getting, when it's getting abutted, whether by it's the femur or the acetabulum, it can be a source of pain. Um, another uh, piece that's uh, very important is restoring the suction, the suction seal. So this is a little bit different than the shoulder. Um, the interarticular pressure of the hip joint is what allows for these individuals to feel that proprioception and allow for them to be pain free. You can see that the ball has gone back uh, underneath the labrum and we've reestablished. This is looking at the cam lesion um, after we're done with the, um, the acetabulum. It's this big bump of bone that's coming off of here. I'm lifting up the iliofemoral ligament, which is the anterior aspect of the capsule here. And we're able to look at it from the 12 o'clock to 6 o'clock position. That's the lateral retinacular vessel right there. So that's how the um, femoral head gets its blood flow. So this is uh, something that we need to be mindful of. Um, but that white stuff that you saw earlier was fibrocartilage on the anterior aspect. And so what we do is we end up taking that, uh, taking that down, we'll debride that uh, fibrocartilage away. And then we come in with a burr. So we have to reshape the femoral neck at this point to make a square peg, a round peg, and uh, allow for the ball to fit nicely back underneath the, um, uh, the labrum. So we reshape, we recontour, and this is once we're done here. So we're looking down, kind of like you look down a ski slope, and we've reestablished uh, the femoral neck offset uh, of in this particular dancer here. And then once we're done, uh, we'll go ahead and do a dynamic examination, make sure that there's no other areas of abutment, and then we'll close that ligament. When, uh, this is the athlete afterwards, after we were able to re, uh, re, uh, reestablish uh, that femoral uh, head neck offset. So in conclusion, this is, uh, this is a very ch a challenging population because these athletes require extreme range of motion requirements for their sports, and they have compensatory soft tissue laxity, uh, which can put uh, stress onto the soft tissue envelope, uh, both on the anterior pelvis, the posterior pelvis, as well as the uh, lateral musculatures. Um, so this is uh, something that is uh, uh, quite uh, challenging from a diagnostic perspective. Um, as a result, these athletes are able to place their hips in the impingement positions, uh, even though um, their normal osseous anatomy and uh, can be uh, comp somewhat compromised. Um, so at the end of the day, it really requires a multidisciplinary approach to be able to manage these athletes. Um, I feel like uh, the, the rehabilitation specialist or the athletic trainer um, is the one that can give me the most insight uh, in terms of the when dealing with these athletes, can let me know who needs to be pushed, who needs to be pulled back, and uh, who, uh, who we need to uh, protect from themselves. So uh, at the end of the day, um, these athletes have some selection bias. Their uh, hips, uh, so to speak, uh, allow for them to be selected into going into this field as well as their passions and drives. Uh, but in terms of the rehabilitation, trying to focus on strength and muscular control is extremely important. So uh, without further ado, uh, we're going to transition uh, to Dr. Julia Iafredi. Uh, she's going to be talking about spine and neck injuries in the dancing athlete. Hey guys, Let's see. Okay, so yeah, I'm going to be talking about spine and neck injuries. Um, I am with the Department of uh, Rehab and Regenerative Medicine. I practice sports and dance medicine, and let's get going. Um, I have no disclosures either, so this is just a list of our objectives. And then, um, so when we talk about uh, dance injuries, we know that there's an average annual percentage of about 67 to 95% of injuries, and most of them are actually non-contact injuries. And the spine is actually the third most common area that can get injured. Um, and there is about a 74% lifetime prevalence for chronic injury in the, in the low back. But why do dancers actually get back injuries? So dancing is obviously physically demanding. It has a lot of complex spine movements that are performed with this high repetition and varying velocities with really intense training programs. So uh, early literature believed that uh, dancers' hypermobility was to blame, but there's actually been a couple of studies that have shown that um, perhaps that if you took away on the Baton scale, if you took away the whole putting the hands flat on the floor, uh, then they found that dancers were no more likely to be hypermobile than the average person. Um, this reinforces the idea that uh, a higher risk exists in populations that are required to perform these repetitive and prolonged movements of the spine. Uh, 
We also know that there's early specialization. So early training allows for the progressive development of the flexibility and the strength that's required to excel in all forms of dance. But when we look at ballet, for example, young dancers are usually committed to pre-professional schools by the time they're 11. And so a lot of these dance students end up require, uh, being required to sustain these really high levels of uh, physical exposure during periods of growth and maturation, which can, again, uh, further increase their low back uh, um, vulnerability, especially when they are dancing for greater than 30 hours per week. Then when we look at males versus females, uh, males seem to incur a higher number and a greater severity of uh, spine injuries. Uh, the lumbar region is at highest risk, and this is thought to be due to workload, um, especially during jumps and uh, landing, as well as lifts, just like in these pictures here. Age also does seem to play a role. So uh, if you have a, a student with rapidly elongating bones um, that exceed their muscular growth, this can lead to muscle tightness. So now this dancer who used to be extraordinarily flexible is stuck and gets really frustrated with themselves. And so they end up um, placing significant stress on their low back in an attempt to kind of make up for inadequate turnout. Unfortunately, it's really difficult to discuss dance injuries without discussing the female athlete triad or what's also known as REDS now, which is the relative energy deficiency of sport. When we look at risk, the greatest risk factors for stress fractures are greater than 12 hours per week of purposeful exercise, low bone mineral density, a BMI of um, greater or less than 21, and then participation in a leanness sport or activity. And so all of those things are what dance is. When we look at dance style, this can also kind of dictate the type of spine injuries they end up with. Um, often, whether it's due to mechanical compensation versus poor form um, and explosive movements. So the main thing to realize from this slide is that every dance style puts a dancer at risk um, for back and neck injuries. And I'm sorry to say, but it turns out even twerking. Um, we're gonna shift gears a little bit now. I wanna talk about some of the actual musculoskeletal injuries. So cervical and paraspinal muscle spasms. There was a study that was done that saw that the smaller uh, cross-sectional area of the multifidi muscle um, was correlated with low back pain. So basically, if you have poor core stability and frequent and sustained asymmetric body positions that go along with this you know, kind of unfamiliar choreography, you're gonna increase your risk for a muscle spasm. Uh, dancers usually complain of sharp, cramp-like pain in their paraspinals. They have uh, really taut muscles with some trigger points and usually decreased range of motion. Um, this does resolve, uh, and often we recommend doing physical therapy just to try to restore a little bit of that balanced core strength. Um, we also will often use short-term NSAIDs, maybe muscle relaxants, and trigger point injections for this. Uh, discogenic back pain makes up about 40% of mechanical back pain, and again, males are more affected by this than females. Uh, pain is fairly vague, and it kind of hurts with everything, um, especially when they're performing a pas de deux, which is just this partnering dance. So it's just partnering with a lot of lifts involved. Um, X-rays are usually normal. Uh, MRI uh, might show some low signal intensity on T2-weighted imaging. Um, but basically what we encourage is conservative uh, treatment with this with poor strength, addressing uh, incorrect technique, and trying to maintain low back flexibility as best we can. So with radiculopathies, these are usually due to compression of a nerve root from a herniated disc, and S1 is the most commonly affected. The straight leg raise, which is the uh, test that we see up in this right-hand corner, is the most sensitive test, and then the cross straight leg raise is um, the most specific. Um, people used to use uh, systemic uh, steroids to try to treat this. Uh, that's not really recommended anymore because all the studies have shown that the steroid use is no better than placebo for this. Um, also, discectomies are usually unnecessary unless there's red flag symptoms uh, present. If symptoms don't improve though, we do recommend getting an MRI to see if there's something else that's missing. So then we end up with spondylolysis. So this is a stress fracture of the pars interarticularis, which is actually the weakest portion of the immature spine. And 90% of them um, occur at uh, L5. Um, Oops, sorry guys. Uh, they are especially common in pediatric dancers and again, males over females. They usually occur because of this repetitive micro trauma and excessive loading. Um, young dancers will often perform this hyperlordosis that I mentioned in order to lock their feet out to give the illusion of 
180 degrees of turnout. And then they'll tuck their pelvis back under to try to flatten their spine. Uh, this increases their risk for acute uh, spondylolysis. Um, patients will complain of this dull kind of unilateral pain that is worse with activities. The classification system you see on the right hand side of the screen uh, now includes a sixth classification, which includes rhizotomies, but the one that we care here is type two because this is um, associated with uh, hyperextension injuries. Um, it is thought to be, or sorry, even though it is twice as common in men as it is in women, females are actually four times more likely to end up with uh, progression of a slippage, and we wonder if that's partially due to their risks of uh, female athlete triad. So with spondylolisthesis, this is actually the progression of that spondylolysis. So patients will have a positive stork test and pain associated with it, and they'll often have tight hamstrings. And then defend, depending on their severity, you might even notice a step-off deformity, which if you look at this picture here, uh, obviously there's a step-off there. Uh, dancers can continue to perform with this if they have a grade one and maybe a grade two, as long as they're asymptomatic and there's no progression of their um, imaging. In terms of imaging, there's a lot of options. Uh, AP and lateral views should be done in standing, and then you can get flexion extension views to look for the amount of um, stability we see. Um, people might remember learning about the Scotty dog in medical school or in school. Uh, the only problem with oblique films is because, because it involves a larger degree of radiation, I actually don't recommend getting them right away and only getting them if you can't see the fracture on a lateral view. If there's still no defect appreciated and you still have a high index of suspicion, then a spec with CT is probably the next uh, recommended option. You can usually see the images really, really well there. Um, MRI does show some irregularity on film, but the problem is there's a high false positive rate because uh, radiologists are actually not trained to look for spondees on MRIs. So it just makes it a little bit tougher to make sure um, you're finding the right thing. In terms of treatment, uh, bracing is really controversial. They used to brace for 23 hours a day. That's really hard to adhere to. So main thing you wanna do is limit their hyperextension and then try to strengthen their pelvic girdle. Um, this can take anywhere between three to 12 months to heal, uh, but surgery is rarely required. Uh, also, if a dancer is skeletally um, immature, you may wanna consider getting uh, x-rays every six to 12 uh, months until they're done growing just to make sure they're healing appropriately. So facet joint sprains occur because of compression of the zygopophyseal joint, um, and then uh, having that involved with hyperextension and rotation like we see in these ball dance, uh, ballroom dancers. Uh, patients often complain of some low back pain with a little bit of paraspinal tenderness and possible radiation into the groin or posterior thigh, but never past the knee. Sacroiliac joint dysfunction is pretty similar, except for this pain is now located a little lower down into the SI joint. Um, uh, they might have pain kind of radiating, radiating into the medial buttock. Uh, Faber and Patrick maneuvers are going to be positive on physical exam, and PT really needs to work with them on core and pelvic girdle strengthening, as well as manual therapies to kind of try to mobilize the joint. Uh, injections can be considered for refractory symptoms. So trauma. So uh, luckily, uh, trauma is significantly less common than uh, overuse injuries, except for in one situation, and that's this. So break dancers, um, unfortunately, do incur a lot more traumatic injuries. Uh, the term break dancing neck was actually coined um, to describe traumatic cervical spine injuries that occurred due to break dancing. Uh, and so this... Um, Basically, that can range anywhere from a cervical spine strain to a tetraplegia. And the idea behind this is that um, it's due to stuff like this, the head spins and um, learning windmills. The other problem there is that um, a lot of people, uh, when they're breakdancing, don't use protective equipment. And that makes sense, right? You're not going to wear a cervical spine when you're, you're doing a, a head spin. Anyways, uh, there are some less common causes also associated that have been shown in the literature. We don't have time to go through them all, but I want you to just be aware of them. So in terms of prevention, I think we need to focus on both primary and secondary uh, methods. We should be doing functional performance testing to help us identify risk factors and recognizing those at risk for female athlete triad. Um, and then if there is an injury that's sustained, uh, there should be some kind of comprehensive approach to rehab. Um, with providers who really understand the unique uh, demands of the dance style. 
So we should also consider referring to sports psychologists because um, there has been a lot of studies that have identified a link between emotional distress and com consumption of uh, healthcare for low back pain. <clears throat> When you are examining a patient, uh, I really encourage you to look at their alignment and evaluate for any compensatory motion. Uh, make sure they aren't doing any of those four T's I have listed there. And look for weak abdominal muscles. Look for the weak uh, or the tight thoracolumbar fascia. Um, there are two tests that have been shown to uh, reliably kind of um, evaluate the lumbopelvic movement, and that's the standing bow test, which is right there, and then the knee lift abdominal test. Um, mechanical low back pain obviously uh, is associated with inhibition of abdominal muscles and glutes and then overactive erector spinae and iliopsoas muscles. And so even if a dancer has good body strength and flexibility, they can often have uh, imbalance in their core musculature. So again, stability training is really important and should remain a cornerstone of rehab of uh, spine disorders in our dancers. So I have a couple of take home points for you. Okay, number one, we need to modify the culture of dance. We do this by improving the access to medical care by physicians and other healthcare professionals that are familiar with the dancer athlete. Uh, this allows us to then facilitate trust. Uh, we also need to focus on preventative efforts and consider doing pre-participation exams, just like we do for any other athlete. Dance educators and physical therapists are very well poised to be able to correct biomechanical imbalances um, that are related to dance training during the growth process. Uh, and some attention should also probably be paid to periodization to try to decrease the risk of overtraining related injuries close to performance time. And my very last thing is, unless the injury absolutely necessitates it, please don't tell a dancer to just stop dancing as a method of managing their injury, because honestly, to some of them, that would be equivalent to telling them to stop breathing. So thanks for everything, guys. Uh, there's my information. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Thanks a lot. All right, that's fantastic. Uh, so we're moving along here. Uh, we're now up to the main event. Uh, we have Dr. Shaw Bronner, who is uh, joining us all the way from Brazil. So we're very honored to have her. Uh, we had some logistical hurdles that we were able to uh, work through, and she's going to be talking about optimizing return to performance in the dancer. So uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. Bronner. Thank you, Dr. Lynch. Um, and thank you to everyone else for the wonderful uh, information you just imparted that then I don't need to cover. <laughs> um, I work at Alvinelli and I established a comprehensive in-house health management program in 1998. And this is, it, we, what we've done is we have a comprehensive surveillance system. We do preseason screening. We uh, do immediate triage and treatment. And over th that first three-year period that we started the program, we were able to, to decrease our new workers' compensation cases by 60%. At six years, we demonstrated over $850,000 savings, in, um, and that was not including the health, that was separate from the healthcare costs. And it, recently, a 15-year reanalysis of the program showed that our, our injuries um, are at an industry low compared to other uh, ballet and modern dance companies with 0.16 time loss injuries per thousand hours of exposure, which is quite low and we're quite pleased with it. This shows that our emphasis on prevention and timely intervention really works. The other thing that was interesting is that we were able to, to change the ratio of trauma to overuse injuries. We reversed this to, to a three to one ratio, which again, I think it's being on top of things, getting into the rehearsal studio, watching what they're doing, protecting them, um, really makes a difference in your overuse injuries. I'm gonna show you some films because we need to look at dance. And this is our company. And this is the repetitive movement that they do in a piece called Minus 16. They're jumping on their knees, they're doing whiplash, they're doing thoracic extension, and then they're really going into hyperextension, and he falls on the floor. They do this repeatedly, this sequence, and each time they take off an, artic an article of clothing, which they're now throwing their jackets, and then they start again, knees, and knees again, and whiplash, and thoracic extension comes next, and hurl themselves over the chair, and he falls on the floor. 
And then we also have our balletic types of ballets where she's in extreme hip flexion, abduction, and extension. This was a ballet that was actually developed for the Royal Ballet called Chroma, it's gorgeous. But um, these are the type of movements. And then finally, knee work is really po popular right now, falling on your knees and then falling in any shape or way or shape or form. So that's what we have to contend with. Whoops. So I'm gonna talk about 10 tips for treating dancers that I think are important things to always remind ourselves about. In the adolescent dancer, early specialization is leading to earlier serious and overuse injuries. And this is nothing new in the general sports world, but it's also true in dance. When we focus only on one thing, we lack diversified activity. We lack the development of appropriate neuromuscular skills that will help us to prevent injury. We don't ever allow rest from repetitive performance of the same movements. So cross training is really where it's at. In the adolescent dancer athlete, we need to think about them being at different developmental and technical levels. We've got growth spurts, we've got hormonal, and we've got cognitive changes going on. We must also bear in mind what is the training quality, the rate, the amount, the vol volume, and the progression. Number two, technique demands are more extreme. This was a great paper where they looked at changes in leg height at the Royal Ballet in, a, in Sleeping Beauty. And they found over a 50 year period that the arabesque ponche went from 125 degrees to 180. The developé side went from 100 to 170 degrees. So greater demands on the body are gonna result in more injuries. Are there more hip injuries? Absolutely. With improved di diagnostic testing, um, and surgic, uh, surgical intervention, we're seeing more labral tears and more FAIs. Over a three-year period, one pediatric clinic, uh, hip clinic, examined 76 patients diagnosed with labral tears and found 25% of those were performing artists. They weren't the soccer players, they weren't the football players, they were performing artists. I think these dancers are forcing themselves into these extremes beyond which their uh, bodies just can't handle. Prevention, intervention, and risk factors. So over here are our intrinsic risk factors that we wanna consider in the dancer. And to the right are the extrinsic work risk factors related to the dance style, the technique, and the choreography. And those two are going to interact into our biomechanical stressors with our motions and awkward postures. So one of the first places we intervene is preseason annual screening. And then we have also developed an outcomes tool that I'll talk about later. Number three, four risk factors for injury in adolescent dancers. We recently conducted a prospective study on 180 pre-professional adolescent dancers and identified these four risk factors. Number one was two to four previous injuries in the, previ in the past year. Number two was bite and hypermobility either greater than or equal to five out of nine or less than or equal to two out of nine. So either they were too flexible or they were too tight. And we had a sweet spot that was a th biting score of three or four. Decreased lower, ex muscle, lower extremity muscle flexibility, including the hamstrings, the rectus femoris, the psoas, and the iliotibial band. And then finally, which has been uh, mentioned earlier, problems in dance technique alignment and biomechanics. Number four, dance style. I think we need to know the vocabulary, we need to know the movements. We need to know then what is proper alignment or, or improper biomechanics. So several areas that I look at because these are key techniques in, at our school are the Graham technique, which includes the floor work, um, which is quite hard on hips, psoas, and knee. Um, and you can see here, she's, she's giving herself a knee valgus. Here, his ankle is in inversion, so those are all stressors. Horton technique involves problems uh, at the hips, hamstrings, and knees. Here we have our flat back sequence, our lateral sequence, and then we have this extreme knee flexion in uh, primitive squats. Number five, aerobic conditioning is inadequate to prepare for the choreography of today. Uh, Wyan et al. Uh, wrote that physiologic training effects of class are insufficient for performance. I absolutely agree, agree based on the 25-minute ballets that are nonstop in our uh, repertory. When we have fatigue, whether it's psychological, mental, or uh, physical, that's going to lead to injuries. We use a simple accelerated three-minute step test, 
to, and look at one minute heart rate recovery to determine what kind of um, conditioning our dancers have. And we found that professional modern dancers, aerobic fitness exceeds that of professional ballet and an ex who exceed the pre-professional modern dancers. So needless to say, we need to target our, our pre-professional adolescent dancers and get them doing more cardio. And we've already mentioned the female triad. Number six, neutral joint alignment and stabilization. We can't just think about neutral spine. We need to think of this at all the joints of the body, and this is how we're going to start to help those hypermobile dancers protect those joints. And again, correction of technique and alignment errors solves most of the problems. When we do a functional uh, evaluation, we look at several different things, and usually we have them take their shoes and tights off so that we can really see what's happening. We always look at demi plie and releve in the parallel position, you, and we look at them in the turned out position as well. Now you can start to see if there's overuse of that FHL tendon, um, if they are impinging when they're going up into uh, a releve, if they're overusing their anterior tibialis every time they go into a demi plie. We look at um, the grand plie in first position and in second position. You want to look at those hip, knee, and ankle alignment. Uh, we also look at the tendu. How it, are they in that sagittal plane um, at the foot and ankle? The pressure releve uh, balance will tell them whether we have the strength to uh, get to the height and whether we have the balance to maintain it. And then finally, looking at jumps in first position so we can understand their eccentric control. Number seven, lumbo-pelvic hip complex is a key point of control. We like to look at the develop ala sacone, and I coined the phrase hipshin. I want to know if they're working in hipshin, and that's really based on the idea of where is their, the angle of their acetabulum. If they're forcing past it, they're going to start doing impingement. So here's a dancer who actually had labral tears with was treated non-surgically, and this is her out of her hip plane of hipshin, and here she is in what is comfortable for her. So I am not an advocate of side splits. Here we have someone is, who is in a passe who is way too lateral, and she's, she's now gone into develop a side, and I'm bringing her forward because now she can access greater amounts of external rotation to help support that limb. Number eight, deep hip muscles are important stabilizers. They, I remind you about the local muscles, who are, which are type one slow twitch muscle fibers. They are going to provide your joint compression and your stiffening. At the trunk, we know that these provide feed forward anticipatory postural adjustments to stabilize and protect. I draw your attention to remind you of the iliocapsularis, which we know is hypertrophied in those, those people with dysplasia, and to the obturator externus, which is hypertrophied in all dancers compared to non-dancers. It serves as a sling to support that hip when they're in high leg extension, such as develop a side. So we want to manage them by protecting them, correcting mechanics. When we work on those deep local muscles, we want to work on them in isolation first, because isolated local training results in earlier feed-forward postural activations. When we just do nonspecific training of local and global muscles, this results in delayed local muscle activation. We want to think about regional interdependence so that we have a global harmony of all of the body uh, participating in the movements. And then we really need to think about rehabbing the, the dancer as an athlete dancer ready for return to play on the field because I think sometimes we're not aggressive enough in those end stages. Here I'm showing some isolated function of iso uh, isolating hip movement while she's trying to stabilize at the lumbo pelvis. And I'm giving her manual feedback in order for her to really find those muscles. Here she's working on trying to do internal and external rotation, but she's not stabilizing her pelvis, is she? But again, as she was learning about that, she can isolate just that movement and provide stability proximally. And this is one of my favorite exercises. It's simply a side-lying passe exercise where she's externally rotating both of her limbs. And this is going to work both the gesture limb when we're in a passe or developé and the stance limb when we are in neutral posture. Finally, we then go to expand to coordinated weight-bearing activities. So she's now using the, this is a Pilates chair. 
and she's standing on a balance board. So she's needing to stabilize on the stance limb as she moves her gesture limb. We're changing levels. She's in a plie now. And we also go to working on rotation discs. She's doing this inside. I love working with rotation discs because uh, they will mat we take away the friction of the floor and now they've really got to use those local stabilizers up at the hip. Um, and again, about level changes are critical. We go from plie to straight to releve, um, and I'm making her balance without holding on to the bar, and she lost it. Feet, don't forget the feet. The feet are how we gesture to our audience. So here we are working on the transverse arch. Um, we must strengthen those foot intrinsics and toe plantar flexors. Um, Dancers use their toe plantar flexors more than uh, non-dancers to do everything from push off and turning to jumping. Here we are working on a balance board. She's in relevé. She's changing the level of her gesture leg and now she's going to do a rond de jean en l'air. Um, and so there's all sorts of fun things you can do, but you can keep it very dance specific. Now jump training is often neglected. And here what we're doing is we're isolating toe flexors in jumping. So we have her on a very light spring, but this is all about motor control. Keep them connected to their community with strict guidelines. Dancers need to be locked down, but that doesn't mean we stop them from dancing. They just need to know what they can do. We need to modify their classes. If they need to mark rehearsals, they can still be present learning the choreography, and we need to protect them. So I will put my dancers in sneakers if I need to slow them down, or knee pads, and this is my company too. But check their customers their costume footwear and check their street footwear. What they're wearing out on the street, I don't like Nike Freeze because they're too flexible and loose. I try and put them in a better running sneaker because uh, they're on their feet all day long and we need to protect them when they're on the cement. Modify the choreography when you need to in, in uh, performance or take them out. See if you can lower the releves. Can you do cheats? When they're ready though, you need to increase their workload from, from the amounts of classes they do to running through the choreography. We do a lot of adaptive taping. We use Luco tape, Elasticon, because it can take body makeup. And, and that's our creative bracing, basically, because I can't be able to see any kind of taping from the house when they are up on stage. Number 10, the Dance Functional Outcome Survey is an outcomes tool we developed because most sports outcomes tools are not relevant. It's a self-report questionnaire that work use, uh, focuses on the lower extremity and low back function. We look, use this on 725 adult modern and ballet dancers. We'll be publishing in Journal of Orthopedic and Sports PT. It's in press now. It was reliable and valid and sensitive to change. So this allows us to determine their health at screening and the effectiveness of treatment and recovery following injury. Currently testing is underway in adolescent dancers as well. So thank you for your time.